two of our series called The Father's Heart, part two. Last week, we came from Luke chapter 15, and we talked about the religious folk who were offended because Jesus, it says, all, all the sinners, all the traitors to Israel, all of them were coming trying to get a piece of Jesus of Nazareth. The town was buzzing whenever Jesus came through. Everybody wanted to hang around Jesus because he was so full of energy. He would inspire you. He'd have you melting in tears. He was just so good, so pure. You just never wanted to leave Jesus of, of Nazareth. And guess what? The religious folk, they were envious and they were jealous. And they were like, you call yourself a prophet. You call yourself a rabbi. What are you doing hanging out with all these losers? These sinners. These rotten, nasty people. You ain't no rabbi. You ain't no man of God. And then Jesus responded to them and gave them three stories to explain his heart. And what we saw is that our father's heart is for his estranged children. He's crazy about them. He wants them. He burns for them. And that's why Jesus was receiving them and eating with them, having dinner and fellowshipping in close, intimate quarters with them because he was on mission and he burned with love for them. Now, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about understanding what was lost. What did we have? I'm always fascinated when I think about Eden, when I read Genesis. I always go back there because that is so fascinating to me. Um, Hollywood is cool. I love some movies. I love The Matrix and things. But you talk about the creator who innovates from nothing, comes up with a world. Like, whoa, a world. And people and animals and plants. Everything you see in the world, God had to innovate it. God had to ideate it. He had to invent it. And I'm like, God, you are inexhaustible. You are an intense, infinitely potent ocean of creativity. How did you do this? And that's what fascinates me. And in this Eden, he created this world, the universe, and all of this. And then he said in verse 26, let us make man. Let us make Adam, Adam in our own image after our own likeness and let man have dominion. Let him have dominion over everything in the air, on the land, and in the sea. Beautiful situation. Put him in a place called Eden. Eden was a paradise. What was Eden like? Eden was awesome. They had dominion. Adam named all the animals. In that Jewish culture, when you name something, you possess it. You have dominion over it. He, could, he had a communication with those animals. Eagle, come here. Eagle would come and respond to his voice. Lion, come. Do this. He was powerful. Adam, don't, he didn't look like us. Okay? Adam was pulsating with light. He was radiating with unimaginable power. He was given the entire world. He was the, the son of God. Read Luke's genealogy. When it gets to Adam, it says Adam, which was the son of God. He was the son of God given the world. He's like, son, welcome to the world. Hey, this is your first gift. I'm giving you keys to this planet. Yes, called Earth. It's all right. <laughs> Our father is like ridiculously rich, powerful, awesome, and we get to be a part of that. It is, it is so good what we have. Um, Edom was amazing. Guess what? Edom had no laws. Edom didn't have rules like don't steal, don't uh, kill, don't uh, do this. Um, Edom had none of that. All Eden was, was walking with God in the dimension of the Spirit by faith. That's all it was. It was just trust. All God said was, hey, there's a tree in the middle of that garden. Um, FYI, Adam, um, I mean, it was just Adam at that point. Adam, FYI, that tree is poisonous. That tree is rotten. If, if you eat that tree, it'll, it'll kill you. So stay clear of that tree. Uh, because if you eat it, that it's so poisonous, it'll kill you that same day. It'll kill you. So Adam knew that, and we know what happened. So this beautiful situation, Eve came along. She was brought forth from Adam, and Eve got uh, deceived by this uh, serpent. Now, I can, I can zoom in on that serpent because I don't believe it was a serpent as we think of a serpent. The Hebrew word there is interesting. It was, I believe it was like a, a being, this light being, who seduced her. I don't know what he told her, uh, but he said, hey, did God say this? He kind of had a lot of truth in it. Well, he knows if you eat it, you'll be like him. They were already like him. They were created like him in his likeness and in his image. But he tricked her. He enticed her. Sin is tricking. It's enticing. It's seductive. But at the end of the day, it's, it's just rotten. It don't work. The Lord just showed me, you know, uh, you'll never find something in your father's creation that's going to be better than him. 
that that doesn't make sense. He's a creator, but you're like, I got something better than you. So we give God the middle finger and say, yeah, I want this so desperately. I'm going to divorce my father who's wealthy beyond measure. I'm going to mar and um, vitiate his character, mess up his name and legacy in pursuit of this so-called pleasure. Come on. You're deceived. I feel sorry for people chasing the air, chasing the wind. Sin don't work. It doesn't. It leaves you empty. But thank God our Father, he's like, I'm going to redeem you. I know you get deceived and seduced and you do things and then you realize, oh man, why? why? But God is going to liberate us. So that paints us a picture of what we had, what was lost. It was tragic. It was horrible. And God, our Father, his heart was broken. It was hurt. You lose one of your children. You lose a best friend. You lose someone that you were very close to and they're gone. Man, that pain, it is tough. That's where our Father is at. Matthew 2 and 18. I'm going to share some little things the Lord showed me as I was just reading this. I wasn't even thinking on this line, but I read Matthew 2 and 18. It talked about there was a sound, uh, the sound of weeping in Rama, Rachel weeping for her children, which are not. She was weeping. She was crying because all the firstborn of Israel were slain by this tyrannical king, Herod, who was jealous of this coming Messiah, Jesus. He was jealous and envious, and he said, just kill it, kill all the firstborn. Kill all the kids, two and under, kill them. This man was murderous and ruthless. And the prophet said there was a sound. He prophesied, Rachel weeping for her children. And then God spoke to me. He said, that's me weeping. That's me. I'm Rachel, and I'm weeping for my children. My heart is crushed. My heart is burdened. My heart is heavy. If I gave you just a piece, it would crush you. If I gave you a piece of the weight of the burden that I'm carrying for my children, we are his offspring. Um, finally, 2 Samuel 18, 32 through 33, real briefly, King David, he was the greatest king in Israel's history. The Messiah was uh, prophesied to be the son of David. David was the, the benchmark, the standard bearer. But one of his sons named Absalom, he rose up and he led a rebellion against his own dad. He was a vicious, murderous traitor. He tried to take his own father's kingdom and he was ruling for a while. Finally, it culminated where David and his men who were hiding out and running from Absalom, hiding in the wilderness, and Absalom with his massive army, they were going to clash and they were going to just have it out. And a long story short, um, David told his commander, I believe it was Joab, he said, whatever you guys do, don't hurt the young lad. Don't take his life. And this young lad did some wicked, some very wicked things. It's R-rated. Okay? I'm not even going to mention it. I, I suggest you read that passage of scripture. He did some very wicked, wicked, evil things to his father. But his father said, don't touch him. And long story short, David's men won. They defeated his son, Absalom. And when the commander Joab said, King David, live forever. Your army, we have defeated this rebellious son of yours and his army. And David said, the young man, is he okay? And they had killed him against David's command. They had killed him and murdered him. And he was hanging. And long story short, David was grieving. He was crying. He was weeping. His heart was heavy. He didn't even celebrate the victory as was tradition. But he stayed in his place and just weeping and fully burdened over his son, crying. And finally, Joab just had enough of this. He was like, king. This rebellious, wicked son of yours, he did all this evil stuff, and you're up here weeping. This ain't right. You're sending the wrong message to your people. Had it been one of us who are loyal, who are faithful to you, your servants, keep that in mind, your servants who serve you with everything they got, you wouldn't shed one tear. How dare you, King David? David woke up and went out and said, hey, congratulations on the victory. But I saw where David's heart was. Let me sum it up this way. David despised his entire kingdom and all of his servants for just one of his sons. He despised it all. My son, even though his son was rebellious and wicked, did so much evil, his son was there. And he said, my kingdom is nothing. My son means everything. Think about us. I'm reminded of Romans 5 and 8. Our father, 
He loves us despite our rebellion. I rebelled. I did wickedness. I did evil in the sight of God. But God still came after me and loved me. He just had no strings, no, con no conditions, no asterisks behind that love. He just said, it's yours. I am your father, Paul. I am your father. And I receive that love. But David, weeping over Absalom, is a father weeping over us. That's our father's heart. I hope that gives you a picture of what we lost. Our father wants it back. And he's going to get it back. That's what... The Great Commission, going into all the world, sharing the good news of the Father through Jesus Christ, and Him dying on the cross and being resurrected from the dead. That's what the message is all about. It's about this big picture. What we had in Eden, what was lost, our Father's heart. We are part of the biggest, grandest, largest initiative in the known universe. We are part of it. We are the children of God, and once we're reconciled, our commander has said, I'm sending you. I believe in you. I know what I put in you. I'm sending you to go into your personal world, into your extended family, into your oikos. And I've sent you by purpose, uh, not coincidentally, the time that you're there, the people that are connected with you, all of that. I've planned it all, and I've put you there, and you're going to reach them. You're going to reach them. You're going to inherit it. It might be a dog fight. You might look silly. You might experience some embarrassment, awkwardness, cringe, as my kids say. You may experience all that, but I'm telling you, do it. Your life is going to change.